Welcome to Story Conversations. I'm Stephen. I'm Travis. We are the founding pastors of Story Church, and we're here to answer your questions, dive into the Bible, and chat about the Christian life together. But before we jump into today's questions, if you could master any skill instantly, it could be anything, sport, instrument, language, what would it be? And Flying. <laughs> Is that a skill or is it a superpower? That's I think a that's more in the superpower yeah. realm. Yeah, that's a great question. Oh man, there's so many skills I'd like to accomplish. Um, again, it's instantly too, so it's not yeah. like you got to work for it. It's like oh, you just have it now. Yeah, probably probably being really mechanical, like mm. being able to fix anything. My my dad's really good at that. And when things break, I'm still like a three year old dad. Dad, can you help me? And he always helps me, which is great. But I'd mm. also love to be super mechanical and handy. So Ooh. what about you? I probably would, you know, a little anti-Tower Babel situation. If I could just like speak tons of different languages and go to the grocery store and like listen to what people are saying when they're talking about me. But also like there's some great YouTube videos out there of predominantly white dudes and black dudes that go in like Asian grocery stores or Middle Eastern stores or restaurants and they just instantly start speaking the language fluently. And there's like yeah. these funny reactions where people are just like, what? And so shocked, but that would be pretty fun to be able to just go different places and, and like connect with people immediately that normally there's like this, there's a, a big cultural and language barrier. I think that would be super fun and it would probably make travel more exciting and feel like, Oh, let's go yeah. wherever. Yeah. One time I was with Scott and we met with a guy that was a missionary in Wales and he was, a, I think it's called linguophile or whatever. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the word of people yeah. who like speak tons yeah. of languages. Yeah, he would, he would, I think he would move to a new place and then pick up the language within a couple of weeks and just mm. have it. It's pretty impressive. Polyglot, that's what it's called. Okay. Yeah, I think you just like pick it up and they just figure out the little nuances and everything. I mean, you and I both have done our Hebrew and our Greek, so we know the burden that it is to learn new languages. Mm -hmm. It's not, I am not a polyglot. It's a no uphill battle. No, Greek is easier than Hebrew for sure for me. For sure, for sure. Well, before we start talking about Greek and Hebrew, because nobody wants that ever <laughs> from a pastor, just a message to all the pastors out there. If any pastors are listening, nobody cares. Do the work, <laughs> preach the sermon, but nobody wants to hear you talk about all your Greek and Hebrew knowledge and study. Sorry. All right. Let's get into some good questions let's here. Do it. First question. What are some practical ways that we can get past our own baggage, shame, guilt from past sin um, that causes us to be fearful to share the gospel? Yeah, I'm assuming that comes from... Uh, perhaps when I was talking about in the sermon about the fear of man that motivates mm -hmm. us in our living. Um, so I would, I would say the first thing uh, that I, that I try to do um, each day, it, really morning, noon and night is I think about Romans eight, one all of the time. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite Bible verses in all of scripture. There is therefore now no condemnation yep. for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, and if you're in Christ Jesus, that is a permanent fixed concrete promise to you. It's not changing. Mm -hmm. So I would, <clears throat> excuse me, I would quote that over yourself. I'd pray that for yeah. yourself. I'd pray that it would become real and tangible and physical and experiential in your life. If that's uh, something that you don't walk in. Uh, and then I would uh, some, just a couple of other quick hitters. Um, I would work out that, that fear and that shame and guilt with a brother or sister in mm -hmm. Christ, depending on, on who you are. Um, and just bring all those things to light continuously. Um, not necessarily the sin itself. You're forgiven from that, but saying, I still struggle with the shame or the guilt over that sin. Help mm -hmm. me walk through that. Um, I think of when Paul commands us to set our minds on things that are above yeah. things that are right, pure, truly and holy. Sometimes I think shame in my life comes up because I'm dwelling on past things, not dwelling on future realities in Jesus. Yeah. Um, and then I would also say, uh, Paul himself is an example. He calls himself a trophy of grace of using his story mm -hmm. um, and his past sin and struggles and his forgiveness in Jesus as, as the opportunity to share the gospel. So it wasn't, he perfected himself and that's all he preached. It was look who I was and look who I am now because of Jesus. And so instead of using your story as something that is nothing but shame filled, yeah, work that out, get, get, you know, get through that with the help of a brother or sister in Christ and, and prayer, but also looking back on it. Don't look back on it with shame and guilt. Look back on it with through the lens of God's grace to mm -hmm. you. So those are some of my immediate thoughts. Yeah. You just stole my answers as well because that's good stuff. Yeah. I'm with you. Take into the Lord in prayer. You know, my, probably my favorite passage, Hebrew four, Hebrews four. 14 through 16 and just reminding, reminding ourselves that God's gone before us. He's experienced all those things that we have yet without sin and we can draw near to his throne, mercy and grace in our time of need. And 
going to believers. Yep. Totally agree with all that. <clears throat> I think I just, what hits me most with this question is not just the, how do we deal with baggage, but like, how does it cause us to be fearful to share the gospel? And yeah, like you said, um, yeah, I just, we often feel like we have to share the gospel and like, we're an example, like suppose, we're supposed to be an example of like, look how good and awesome life can be. And you can be because of Jesus, as opposed to, like you said, being a, being a trophy of grace. And I wouldn't say not, not only with sharing the gospel and evangelism, but just in general, like, I think it's been most freeing in my life to just like we talked about a little bit last week of my story and you shared your story a bit. It's not just about in a, in a, you know, evangelistic moment, but just in general, like letting, um, the, your past and your shame not define you and not wearing things as a, as some sort of a badge or something or treating it like it's cool, um, whatever your testimony is, but just don't let it be a secret. Don't hide it. Don't pretend, you know, that, you have to be something or present as something like it's powerful. Um, not just certainly to those who are not in Christ to be like, wow, you know, this isn't religion. You're not this really p- well put together, like nice image, you know, presented, um, of a person trying to convince me to join your cult. Cause that's what it feels like to people. And they're like, Oh, this is fake or, Oh, wow. I could never be there. I'm too messed up. But even with other believers, I think just, if we cease this whole like, idea of being attractive and tidy and clean and neat in our image management with each other, like it just breaks down a lot of walls and um, like we can wear our own past brokenness and present brokenness as a, as a testimony to who God is and that he's the hero, but also like, so we can keep growing, keep learning and whatnot. And so, yeah, I just, every time I've had like a really profound conversation with a non-believer, it's always been, you know, even if they're trying to steer it to like a, apologetics conversation and they start asking me a bunch of hard questions. I always try to steer it more towards like, Hey, well, here's my story. Here's how God saved me. Here's what God saved me from. Here's how God is still sanctifying me, changing me. Mm-hmm. And like, man, it's awesome. Like we all want that. Cause I think there's this idea we all have that like people want what looks good and that, you know, we're broken and other people aren't. And it's like, no, mm-hmm. everybody's jacked up. Everybody's broken. Everybody's hiding it. And you take that risk to not be that person we've talked like we talked about before in church and whatever <clears throat> just break down it breaks down walls and makes you feel free and like that's actually how jesus gets glory not when we try to hide those things or present really well like that that brings us glory not jesus glory yeah, yeah so. there's 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 great power in the tongue um there's power to tear down or there's power to build up and that applies, you know, primarily to other people in our encouragement or mm-hmm. our speaking blessing or cursing over them. But it also applies to your own life. And um, and I'm not talking about, you know, manifesting or, you know, creating your existence by a word of faith movement. I think that's nonsense. Mm-hmm. But what I am saying is if you're consistently struggling with shame over past sins, like continue to confess that. And the the power of the tongue to eliminate the power of that shame over you, like don't underestimate that. And 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 I've talked about this before. I think in a sermon, or maybe just you know in some discussions. But um, nuance. I, I'm not a Joel Osteen fan at all. Don't listen to Joel Osteen ser- sermons on the record. Yeah. But the one thing that he does at the beginning of every service, I've watched it before, is uh, he holds up the Bible. And the whole congregation recites this like deal with him mm-hmm. where, and, and I don't know a word for word, but it's basically like recite with me. I am who this says I am. Mm-hmm. And they're using that in an evil way to say I'm rich and I'm healthy and all yeah. those kind of things. But I actually think that's a really good thing for Christians mm-hmm. to walk in is to say, I am who this says I am. So if you're a Christian, what does that mean? You're forgiven. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You're, you're redeemed. You're whole. You are saved. You are secured. You have a future inheritance. You have promises that every promise finds its yes and amen in Jesus. You're mm-hmm. in Christ. You're united to him. Like, what does the Bible actually say about your identity? It's not defined by your past sins or your shame. Your identity is in Christ. And so you need to hold that Bible and where there's a promise made to Jesus, that promise is simultaneously made to you. Mm-hmm. And when something is spoken over Jesus, it's simultaneously spoken over you. Like we're not working to hear well done and good and good and faithful servant. We've already heard that if we're in Christ, mm-hmm. we are like Jesus already approves of us. Yeah. And so like, I think even in this question, there's some identity stuff going on. Am I a shameful person? Am I just a sinner? It's like, no, who are you in, in Jesus? And use the power of the tongue to speak that. And, and eventually the words will work its way down into your heart. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's the theology, our theology is important here too, because even this idea of, 
the fact that we have baggage, like that's a very big word and very commonly used word, but as a believer, you don't have baggage, right? Like we, we, we are grabbing things God has freed us from and holding on to them, Mm -hmm. especially when we're talking about past sins that are not present in your life. Certainly there can be a sense of feeling in bondage to sin and struggling in different ways, but when we're taking on something God has taken off of us and we're putting it back on, um, like that's not just a resting in Christ. That's like, we need to go back and go, what lie am I believing? Well, the lie you're believing is that you are your sin. You are your past. You are your shame. And that it even is there that you are carrying baggage. Like certainly there's emotional impact and consequences of, of, you know, regrets. And like, it's not that we're no longer impacted from it, but it's this idea that Jesus has taken it from us and he's cast it as far as the east is from the west and, and the dip and the into the depths of the sea. He he took all of our sin on himself when he died and that that theological reality is important because even just in our language, we have to go, hey, there's an impact of our sin. Mm-hmm. We have regrets. We have yep. we're reminded of things. We go, oh, I wish I wish I hadn't done that. I can't believe I did this. And we we feel shame. And like that's a process of going to the Lord. But it isn't baggage. It, it baggage is when we're making it something. And yeah. God's like, hey, no, you don't have baggage. I, I've taken it from you. It doesn't have to be that yeah. way. Yeah. One of our great struggles as, as finite and fallen humans who are unlike God in some ways, in a lot of ways, we're made in his image, so we're like him in some ways, but um, we don't have the ability to see ourselves the way God sees us. Mm-hmm. And, and I think a, a thing that will spur on sanctification and mission is be, the ability to grow in seeing yourself as God sees you. And, and again, how does God see you? Forgiven, freed, all mm-hmm. of these things that, that we're, we're talking about. And, and even as we continue to work through Galatians, I think towards the end of chapter three, going into chapter four, Paul is going to make this comparison between slavery and sonship. And when you are moving back to legalism or you're letting shame or something else define you, you are actively giving up your birthright of sonship and trying to enslave yourself again. Mm-hmm. And you don't need to do that yeah. because that's not how God sees you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My, my sermon this next week. Um, it's going to dive into a lot of this. So we'll, we'll talk more about this mm-hmm. then hear it from the word. And then I'm sure next week as well. All right. Uh, question two, what are some examples of non salvation issues that we can all have some more moral clarity about? Wow. Um, we live in a morally ambiguous age, so we have to be, we have to be discerning and wise in how we view ethics and norms and, ideologies and stuff like that. And I have a, had a professor, Gary Brashears in seminary that one of his constant phrases in w- when you're going to preach, when you're studying, when you're counseling, when you're just walking through the Christian life, he would, he would always say where the Bible speaks clearly, you speak clearly where the Bible's a little less clear, be careful. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this is what he was speaking to. There is maybe some fundamentalism or legalism that arises in, in some churches around moral issues. So they're moral issues, but they fall out of the salvation camp and into the wisdom camp. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is salvation issues that story church will never budge on. You know, Jesus is God. Jesus is the way, truth, and life. Um, the Bible is inerrant. It is, it is God breathed. Like there are tons of like Mm -hmm. core issues that if we lose these, we lose the gospel. If we lose the gospel, we lose salvation in God himself. But when it comes to moral issues that are in the wisdom category, where the Bible is clear, we have to be clear. So when we're thinking about marriage and gender and sexuality, we stand for the fact that marriage is between a man and a woman forever. Mm -hmm. That's God's design. Anything outside of that design, whether it be what so-called, you know, no fault divorce or fornication or... Um, the LGBTQ movement, those things are outside of God's design. And we need to have moral clarity on those things because the Bible is clear Mm -hmm. where the Bible begins to get less clear. We need to be careful with each other. Um, I think the example that I used on Sunday was homeschooling. Mm -hmm. I said, homeschooling is a way, not the way. And I think Christians should have a lot more charity with each other when it comes to issues that are a way among faithful ways not the way and the only way. Mm-hmm. And, and so like, again, giving examples off the top of my head, I can't, I can't think of a ton, but we encounter them every day in the workplace with our kids. And, and so there's some initial kind of like high level thoughts. What, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I kind of thought, I think about this in a couple different categories. I think there's some things that there's some sin issues that are not like the sin issues are not 
going to disqualify us from salvation. Um, but there's disagreements sometimes, or what I would say is almost like a category of sins that we downplay that we've sort of softened our approach to or gone, eh, maybe this is something everybody can kind of just choose what they want to do. Right. Things like gossip, slander, yep. lying, cheating, like dishonest stuff. Um, but even things like what we say and our language and humor and like how we approach, like what is godliness and what is, you know, what is building others up versus like, well, you know, <clears throat> so I think there's some things like that where we kind of go, well, you know, I kind of want to hold these ones. I'm going to kind of do these myself that are actual straight up sin issues that are very clear in scripture that we could walk through all of those and say, no, like the Bible is just really clear and we all know where we struggle and where we need to repent. But um, it's not a, a salvation issue when it comes to, you know, um, how the gospel plays out and who saves us. But it is it is an, it's a result of mm -hmm. the gospel it's, and it's an obedience issue. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, you know, there's some other other areas like, you know, food and drink. Um gluttony mm -hmm. and drunkenness mm -hmm. um, specifically mm -hmm. that are other areas that we downplay um, where we say, well, you know, I'm going to overindulge or I'm going to binge eat or whatever. And I'm just going to like allow myself to like go too far in what I consume, whether it's food or alcohol and kind of go, well, I've just decided like arbitrarily in my brain, I kind of know what's okay and not okay. Or I, I know my limits and there's not really like a holy pursuit of like, wow, is this honoring God with my body? Mm -hmm. And am I, am I in control? Of my faculties is, is, am I, am I living, uh, is the, the, the fruit of the spirit, you know, of self-control, is that a part of my life? Is, is that shown in how I engage with food and drink? Um, and I, I think it's a huge one that's mm -hmm easy to downplay. So for me, those are kind of some areas of like downplaying sin issues that are really clear in scripture that mm -hmm. we just don't want to admit sometimes, or we don't want anyone to say anything about. Um, but then I think the other category are issues where they're more convictional, um, things that, that there can be disagreement on and mm -hmm. it's not a sin issue. It's right. not a, there's a, Hey, the Bible is clear here and we're just afraid to, to doc, talk about it because we disagree. Um, it, there's, it's actually clear and things like, you know, yeah, like you said, parenting um, and schooling, both of those of like how you do it, marriage, mm -hmm. like what, is, what actually does, does your relationship look like with your spouse and how, how traditional from like a one on one end of the spectrum of like a hierarchical kind of um, situation um, and headship and, and there being this like linear um, look to it versus, you know, on the other end of the, of the spectrum of being a team and, and like, well, how does that work itself out? And how, how does the husband still um, serve as the role of the leader and to sacrifice for his family as Christ sacrifices for the church? and do all, all the things the Bible says and a, and a wife to, to submit to her husband, like how that plays out in nuanced ways. Like there's different convictions mm -hmm. on what specifically that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I, I think things like that and, uh, and certainly politics and political activism, like what does our involvement look like in both what, who do we vote for? Do you have to be registered as one party as a Christian? And that's the right party um, versus, you know, evaluating every election, you know, what you're going to do and uh, praying through your own decisions. And then, you know, even how active you are or not, like maybe you vote and that's it versus no, you're getting involved in your community and you're going to different events and you're you're wanting to get involved in what's going on. Like there's a lot of different opinions on those things. And there's very clear ways that we are to honor God and, and how we live. And we're to, to try to pursue justice in this world. And we're supposed to seek for the good of the city that we're in. And we're supposed to pray for our leaders, but how that, how, how that specifically it breaks itself down and how that applies in our daily life. There's a lot of differences there. And, and that's an area where uh, there needs to be moral clarity. There needs to be discernment there, but it's not a, Hey, Hey, here's how it's supposed to be. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what story church says. And you're either in or you're out. It's black or white. Like right. those are complex areas, but they're not areas that are, um, I think where I'm, how I'm reading this question is that we do need moral clarity there. Yep. It's not a free for all. doesn't matter. Just, you can't say anything. Like it's good to talk about that and talk mm -hmm. about why you land different ways and how you got there and to see a gen and I remember during COVID just hearing like, um, very clearly like, genuine thought out godly responses to everything that was going on in our world from the election to BLM to masks and COVID stuff of genuinely people trying to honor the Lord and coming to different convictions and how they responded to those things, not as a reaction, not as any kind of like a, you know, getting caught up in a movement, but just trying to be faithful Christians and coming to different conclusions um, and seeing that and being like, wow, like these are two different people that are genuinely pursuing the Lord 
that have different convictions and it's expressing how they mm-hmm. live differently. And like, that's okay. Yeah. You know? And so, yeah, that's, that's kind of how this, how this hits me most is I think there's, there's that one first category that we need to not say are, Oh, that's just a convictional issue. Right. No, the Bible speaks clearly on how we behave and what mm-hmm. we consume and how we engage and how we speak and how we treat people. And we need to be serious about that. And then there are other areas where we need to seek wisdom. We need to seek godly counsel. We need to be thoughtful and we need to, be concerned about whether or not we are surrendering to Christ and how we live out those convictions, but also be able to stand by those convictions. Mm-hmm. And, and, and if, if they're thought through and we're, we're seeking the Holy spirit and it's okay yeah. if we don't agree. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that's all, that's all real key here when it comes to, to this idea of moral clarity, because I think when I think about my own questions around that kind of stuff, what I'm yearning after is, is justice. Right. And that's a right thing to yearn after when we see something that's broken and backwards, the Christian, the spirit dwelling within Mm us gives the Christian, you know, an an inward desire a a holy discontent when things are wrong and backwards Mm -hmm. to say, I want that to be right. Um, And again, like you exactly, you said, I'm not going to repeat everything you said, but when it's sin issues and the Bible's clear, like, yeah, go, go be, be clear on that. Um, Don't be mean, but be clear. Yeah. Um, But when it comes to some of those secondary issues, I think, for myself and in Christians everywhere, like we need to pump the brakes a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I find myself coming to conclusions so quickly and I didn't take time to step back and say, what does the Lord say about this? Have I prayed about this? Have I considered this? Have I talked to other people about this or have I just come to my conclusion? Cause I heard an Instagram, you know, video or TikTok reel that says this is true. So it must be true. And therefore I think I'm clear about it. Yeah. Or have I slowed down a little bit? And then I think on the other end of all of that, we have to have unity through these things. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying don't disagree, but have unity at the end of the day, when it comes to a wisdom issue Mm -hmm. of, of any number of things that it is not affecting someone's salvation and it shouldn't affect your fellowship with that person either. Uh, have robust dialogue and then, <laughs> and then uh, move on, uh, move on together. And so I would say, slow down, be careful, be wise, be full of the spirit, submit to God. Um, and then, and then come to your conclusion and be open to being wrong. Yeah. Cause you could be wrong. I could be wrong. I think an example in my life that I'm constantly wrestling through is like, I am intentionally a very late adopter of anything technology. Um, technology terrifies me Mm. in a lot of ways, advancement in in technology, lots of reasons why I don't have time to, to share any of that. And so in our home with our kids and in my own personal life, we try to be very slow on those things, but that doesn't mean that's the right way to do things. Mm. Um, we're open to being wrong about some of our conclusions. Um, and we're also open to gladly eating dinner with anyone who's an early adopter of everything that comes out yeah <laughs> that claims Christ because that's a brother or sister in Christ that we're gonna worship with forever mm. so that's good yeah I mean some I think somewhere this ties into book of Galatians as well as you know Paul says he wants to be he's sought to be all things to all men and I think where we see the dark version of that, the twisted version of that is hypocrisy of pretending to be all things to fit in with all men. Essentially, right. you could, maybe you could say that's what, that's what Peter was doing and got called out for. And there's this idea that not that we change who we are, but that we can actually exist in different spaces and relationships because we're not holding so tightly to non-essential non-gospel issues that we can't even be around and be in fellowship yeah. with people who disagree with us. Like that's what Paul embodied for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of unity. Um, and then it just a verse that, that has been incur- helpful for me in this is again, first Corinthians just talks so much about Christian freedom and how we deal with insiders and outsiders and how we should treat each other. But first Corinthians 10, 23 through 24 says all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. And I I do think a lot of this does come down to certainly first and foremost, pursuing and building good convictions through the Holy spirit. Like you said, not just thinking your gut is the Holy spirit and just your reaction is what's right. Yeah. Or some random source of of information (laughs) or some person or your parents or your upbringing or whatever. Like that doesn't mean that it's infallible and that's what you should do. But also the golden rule, like treat other people the way you want to be treated. Like you don't, nobody wants to go out in the world. It's the greatest fear we have as Christians is that we're going to talk to somebody and they're going to hate us because we're a Christian. They're going to call us a big, mm-hmm. we're so afraid of people immediately making assumptions about our character because of a disagreement. And we're so afraid of that. We're afraid to say what we really think. And yet oftentimes 
we do the same thing to other people. We are so strong, especially in the church, so strong on our on our convictions that we're just harsh to other people and we we try to push them on others, even with good intentions maybe at times, not realizing that like that's not the win and that's not what the gospel is about. And so even just thinking about that, like this idea of like not seeking your own good, your own version of justice, your own like just wanting to be comfortable, wanting everyone around you to just see things the way you do. It's, life is easier, let's be honest, when it's that way and when you find yourself there. But like, that's not that's not good. That's not what the gospel does. The gospel brings us together and and pushes us to Jesus and rallies us around Jesus, mm-hmm. even if there's difference differences and disagreements. And so, yeah, I think this idea of um, Christian freedom can become a battering ram that we use against other people because we want we want others to see things the way we do. Um, but that's that's just not always right. And so I think it's an interesting tension of you want to have strong convictions and you want to be gracious with others. Mm-hmm. You want to believe and work through what you believe and how you live honestly and and with with in- integrity and and with thought. Um, but you also want to be open handed and go, I might be wrong. I might need to learn from someone else. Someone else's experiences or perspective may help me see something I'm missing. And so it's a tough thing because you, yep. you don't want to be uh, brash and, and rigid, but you also don't want to be wishy-washy mm-hmm. and you know a hypocrite. And so I think those are, those are the two dangers that we have. And I, only way we can do it is following Jesus and mm-hmm. staying tethered to his word mm-hmm. that we can try to, um, walk in that tension in a way that creates unity, but, but also we're honoring the Lord and we're Mm -hmm. obeying, Mm -hmm. obeying him in ways that he's called us to, to live. Yeah. I think, I think one thing we all have to recognize is how formed by the world we are Mm -hmm. because we live in it for most of the week. You know, we go to church for an hour and a half. If I preach a long sermon, uh, maybe an hour 15 on a normal Sunday, Mm -hmm. And we may go to a home group for two hours and our, our students might go to student ministry. So like all told, we're you're going to spend six hours out of our 168 in and around church people and the word yep. and stuff like that. So most of the 168 hours of the week were being formed by the podcast we listen to and the, the news stations we listen to and in the newspapers we're reading and the news station, those kind of things. And, and I think it's just a natural byproduct product of the world where we've been living in for the last decade is that it is so divided. The world is so divided. Like we'd be fools to not say mm-hmm. that that's true. And so naturally we're, we are so divided in the church because we're formed by the world. And I'm mm-hmm. not speaking specifically of our church. I'm talking about the, the big yeah. C at large church, like the division, the things people are willing to divide over. I look at that and I think, man, that's so silly. Yeah. That's like the whole Alistair Begg situation that's going on right now. I don't even yeah. rehash controversy for the sake of it, but this man's been faithful for 45 years. Yeah. Like dude's a Christian and he's mm-hmm. one of my favorite preachers mm-hmm. back off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we don't need to, we don't need to import the division of this world and the character assassination of this world and mocking people and giving them nicknames and stuff like that and bring that into the yeah. church. So then I think on the back end of that, if the church were to be a place that does have moral clarity, but also openly works through differences and isn't divided, think about the missionality of that. Yeah. Like how attractive is that to a watching world to say, wait, all of those people of different stripes love each other, yeah, serve each other, give to each other, laugh with each other, mm-hmm. vacation with each other. What's different? What's different is the spirit of Christ that creates unity. Yeah. We know that, but we get to share that with a watching world and say, we disagree about schooling, we disagree about how we use our time. We disagree about tattoos, you know, yeah. just to bring up silly things. And and yet we're still united. And then we take those silly things and we expand it out to bigger and bigger issues that are not sin or salvation issues, but wisdom issues. And yet we're still united. Like, good night. Yeah. How attractive is that to a world who is weary from warring all the time yeah. with each other? Yet that's the only, that's the only mode we've been conditioned to be mm-hmm. in is always at war always trying to argue, always trying to dismiss and those kind of things like, man, like, like how endearing is that? So, yeah, I love that. I mean, the world has a fake version of grace, which isn't real, which is this like idea of acceptance that isn't real because not everyone's accepted. You're Mm -hmm. only accepted if you believe certain things and it changes constantly, but there's this idea that, oh, but no, the world is so accepting and you know, Christians aren't. And it's like, no, like there's actually a genuine acceptance of brokenness and background to be found in Christ when he saves you and redeems you, not because of where you were or where you are. That's real. And the world also has a fake version of conviction, which is like, man, there's these heralded ideas of justice and things are right. And then there's just hypocrisy and inconsistency. And it applies only some ways and sometimes and 
constantly finding out what's really going on behind the curtain and leaders being exposed. And so like the world has like a false version and a corrupted, just like terrible version of justice and a terrible version of, of acceptance and love that aren't real and are hypocritical and inconsistent and break down. But in the church, in Christ, you actually have real versions of those things that that do coexist, that do exist in a way that go, how, how can you have both? Mm-hmm. How can you not just be dogmatic or just be open and accepting? Like, how can there be, a, how can those things be together? It'd be grace and mercy and an openness to all to come to Jesus and have strong convictions and belief and theology and submission to truth and, and, and ultimate, you know, truth and reality. Like, they're the things people crave. People want truth. They want to know what's what. What should I do? Just tell me what to do. They want that guiding rudder, um, and they want to be loved and accepted. And it's like, man, the world the world's version of that isn't real. And so, right. the best thing we can do is show people how God does that for real. Right. And and we should, as a church, do both and show people both, which doesn't make any sense and is hard to do. But that's the gospel. That's it. All right. Question three. Do you have any advice and words of wisdom when humble confrontation does not lead to reconciliation between believers? And I think probably would be helpful just to talk more about confrontation, yeah. more about reconciliation in general between yeah. believers as well. Yeah, maybe before we kind of talk about godly confrontation, let's answer the question directly. I'm, I'm, let me just say that's sad. Yeah. <laughs> that's not God's intention. Um, even Galatians six, when, when you discipline someone and you're bringing them back into the fold, when you're disciplining, you're disciplining through tears and broken heartedness. Cause that's yes. not God's design. Confrontation exists because sin exists and sin is sad. Yeah. So I'm sorry that reconciliation is not coming. The other thing I would say is that we have to be better at being on God's timetable. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yes. sometimes reconciliation doesn't happen in a week. Sometimes it does. And when it does, praise God, I pray it's real and enduring. Yeah. Um, but s- most times <laughs> it doesn't happen in a week. Sometimes it takes years, years. So I would say in the interim, keep praying mm-hmm. for reconciliation. Keep extending the olive branch, so to speak, and, and, and creating opportunities for reconciliation. Um, and then even there's been situations in my life where I feel like the reconciliation is not happening fast enough. And then I do some more digging in conversation and prayer and I figure out actually I'm the problem, not mm-hmm. them. Yeah. <laughs> so you might be surprised and maybe reconciliation is not happening because um, you're the one who is in the wrong here and your confrontation maybe was off in the first place. And so you need to actually go repent to create that reconciliation. So I'm sorry. That's sad. Seek it. Mm-hmm. Wait on God while you're waiting. Pray and, and keep going. So those are my, some of my initial thoughts. Yeah. I think a lot of this has to do with the heart. Um check your heart as the old, the old annoying Christian phrase goes, but Mm -hmm. truly like what is our intention when we go to confront a brother or sister? Um, it's not to make justice happen for ourselves. It shouldn't be. Um, I think we have to be really cautious. We're not trying to resolve things in such a way that like makes us seen as right. That creates a form or outcome of justice. That's on our terms in our timetable or resolve something in us um, or out of anger you know, out of, out of a desire to sort of put someone in their place and feel in some ways out of pride too, that we posture ourselves. Like we want someone to have to like, you know, face the music. Like those are wrong desires, um, that I think can corrupt, you know, what we think sometimes is, Oh, I, I went into this, like trying to confront, confront somebody and I want to be restored. And it's like our hearts and our attitudes just so off. And it's, it's about us. It's not actually about them. Cause I think ultimately it has to come from love. It has to be a desire for, um, our fellow believers to be made right before the Lord more than anything else to, to want them the best for them and what God wants for them, which is obedience and peace and restoration, um, between believers. So I think we have to check our hearts and, um, see like what, what, what God is actually trying to do. And are, is it, are we trying to create something for ourselves or is it actually, um, something that's submitted to the Lord that we trust him with? And, um, something that's just rung in my ears um, over and over and over um, over the years is um, this, the phrase that a mentor said to me once, which is you are not the Holy spirit for other people. Mm -hmm. I think there's a difference between gospel confrontation um, where we are watchful for those we love and that we're in community with that we have relationship with um, to see, you know, areas of hurt, brokenness, um, you know, potentially um, them going astray and veering off and like wanting to bring them back so that they're where God wants them to be out of love. 
like we are supposed to be watchful and not lazy and you know we're supposed to pay attention to those things um and we are called to judge others as we talked about a couple weeks ago you know the bible says in the church and like yep we are supposed to judge each we're supposed to be watching each other and looking out for each other um to see if our actions are lining up with our words and to see if our lives are lining up with god's Mm -hmm. word um but our job is not to be the holy spirit yeah or if i think a good gut check is am i thinking more about how a sermon about God's word or about whatever. Am I thinking more about other people's sin and what they, what needs to change in them and what's broken in them? Um, I think that's when we veer into some territory where our hearts are probably not in the right place. Mm-hmm. If we're preoccupied with that, because gosh, like, can you imagine if everybody was aware? I can, I can only imagine if everybody was aware of my own, my own flaws all the time. and was constantly thinking about how I need to grow and change and what's messed up with me. Like, gosh, that's crushing. And also like, that's just, that's, it's gross. That's not helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I, you know, Matthew seven, three through five says, why, you know, why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but not notice the log that's in your own eye? And how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye, you hypocrite first take the log out of your own eye, then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And I don't think that it's fair to use that verse as like, oh, never confront people because be afraid that somehow you're missing something. We always are. Um, But it's a good, uh, it's a good sobering truth from Christ. That's we need to be really careful that we're not preoccupied with other people's sin um, more than we are with our own and that we're we're not submitting if we're in a situation where we're praying for other people to change and we're frustrated and we're just constantly thinking about other people's brokenness in the church or in the world um, and we're not more ser- at, as if not more serious about our own brokenness and our own errors and, and asking others and the lord you know seek me and know me reveal any wicked way that is in within me to the Lord and to others, like we're in a bad spot. So not to say that if reconciliation isn't going well, that's why, but I think the heart is so important. Mm-hmm. It's not just about how it goes and whether or not it goes well. And, and I do think that it, if, and when it doesn't go, go well, there's a profound amount of peace we can have when we know we've handled ourselves with mm-hmm. godliness. Mm-hmm. We've, per, we've pursued it in a way that God has called us to, and it's not been with any evil intentions. And then truly when someone, um, we can talk in a bit about like how to actually do this, what God's word says, I guess I think that'd be helpful, but like we can say, all right, God, they're yours. You know, you can, you can wash your hands of it when someone just utterly and completely rejects you uh, and doesn't listen to what you have to say, doesn't listen to other believers, doesn't listen to the church, you know, however far it goes. Like you can, it's awful, it's tearful, but you can, you can just, you can say, Lord, they're yours and he's going to do what he's going to do. It's not on you. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, you don't have to carry that weight and burden. Yeah. Yeah. So when we're considering this idea of biblical confrontation, um, the obvious passage is Matthew 18 of how to, how to go, but I want to take it one step deeper than that to begin with, because Matthew 18 begins on the premise that someone has sinned against you. Mm-hmm. Um, that's most often, or you've seen them sin against someone else. Right. That's most often when biblical uh, confrontation is warranted. I think a lot of times we confront around preferential issues, not sin issues. Mm-hmm. And we need to be careful. And and one of the, Francis Chan, probably among many others, I heard him one time say, like, if you're, if you're reading the Bible, you've been offended by it at some point. And one of the passages that still offends me to this day which is a silly thing to say, but you know what I'm saying Mm -hmm. is Proverbs 19, 11, where we're told to overlook offense. Yeah. And the little justice in me, like I, when I was growing up, I was like, I always got to get the last word in. I always have to be right. Not a big turn the other cheek guy. Yeah, that's right. Like pacifism is not for me. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) It's hard. It's hard. But like this idea of overlook offense, if it's not egregious, ongoing, unrepentant yeah. sin. Yeah. If you know, I've, I've been involved in, in silly confrontations in churches where someone's like, Hey, I was walking down the hallway and pastor so-and-so oh, didn't yeah. say hi to me. Yeah. And I'm offended and we need to figure this thing out. And I honestly, I'll get in those meetings and sit down and be like, this is a ridiculous. We're going to pray for each other. We're done in five minutes. Yeah. Move on with your life. Yeah. Like seriously, I've done that. Yeah. Uh, over, I believe it. We, <laughs> we, we need to be better at overlooking yeah. offense. Yeah. Um, especially when it comes to, when it comes to preferential issues, we can't be these little justice warriors that everything's got to be conformed to the way I've chosen to live. Going back to the question about moral clarity in categories of wisdom and discernment, those kind of things like just move on with your life and go share the gospel with someone. Yeah. Um, but so that aside there, when there is a, a, a blatant, unseen, unrepentant sin in someone's life, 
that you're in relationship with, it's it, it, it's a wise thing to go confront them. Yeah. And I think posture is everything. I have your best interests in mind. I love you. Jesus died for you and because Jesus mm-hmm. died for you and he commands you to, to be holy as he is holy, I think there's an area of your life that's out of step. Like Paul says in Galatians 2, mm-hmm. your life, Peter, is out of step with the gospel. Your behavior is out of step mm-hmm. with the gospel. When we see that in other people's life, we need to come with a low posture and say, my, my life in, in some ways is out of step with the gospel and, and I'm just seeing this in you and I'm not assassinating your character. I'm not saying you're not a Christian. What I am saying is I'm going to plead with you to mm-hmm. turn away from that. Yeah. And Lord willing, like that conversation, most times if you come in with that posture, someone's going to hear that. The defenses are going to be down. They're yeah. going to say, yeah, you, yeah, you're right. I, I know that. I, I spoke to my wife wrong mm-hmm. and I need to go, I need to go repent and turn from that. If things continue, if they're hard hearted and unrepentant, then we elevate those things. We bring in others in our community, two or three need to go and confront that person and hopefully plead with them. And confrontation is never a bring a hammer down. Mm -hmm. It's always a, I'm pleading with you, brother. I'm pleading with you, sister. There's a better way than this. I want to show you the better way. If they continue to, to, you know, not repent and, you know, if they're a member of the church, then you, you start bringing leadership involved and, 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 and then it keeps escalating from there. But I think when it comes to confrontation, we need to discern out of the gates is this a preferential issue or a sin issue issue? And then if it is a sin issue, what is my posture going into this? Yeah. To begin with. For sure. I mean, we'll get there eventually. It's Galatians six. Yeah. That's the other, you know, obvious passage that comes to mind, but talks about not just going and, you know, seeking to confront someone who's caught in sin, but the, the line in, I think it's verse two. Yeah. Verse, verse one, keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted Mm -hmm. in the, in the pastor world. Um, the phrase, but for the grace of God, there go I, is probably one of the most, uh, very, uh, in recent years especially, thrown around and shared this idea that, especially as you see pastors who fail in ministry, who disqualify themselves, um, like so often we can see sin in others and judge it and be like, oh, I can't believe they did this. I can't believe you did this. I can't believe that someone would go there rather than having this, wow, but for the grace of God, you know, I'd be there essentially. Um, and wow, I need to be on guard and be sobered by, by that. That's huge. Like not just trying to say the right words and be honoring and and peaceable and have the right like tactics, but genuinely having the right heart where we're going in going, wow, I could be in this situation just like anybody else could be. That totally changes, um, your approach and people can, people can feel like you're saying, like people can totally tell where you're coming from versus if you're coming down on someone from a a position of perceived authority, Mm -hmm. um, or you think you compare in some other way. And there's some other like good, just general principles, um, that I think are helpful of just um, like speaking to people, not about them Mm -hmm. Um, going directly to the person, Mm -hmm. whatever it is like, man, we get in hot water. It's we're, we're a a frog in a boiling, boiling pot where we don't realize how, how uh, far we've gone when we go to someone else and for advice to go confront somebody, or we want to talk about it because someone hurt us that can just get out of hand so quickly. And then by the time you actually talk to somebody, if you ever do, how many other people are involved, how many other people have heard about it, how much conversation has happened about the person um, with other people versus just going to the person um, in question and just talking directly to them. It's not unwise to seek counsel from a pastor or from a home group leader or like help me. I don't know what to do. Pray for me. But I think that needs to be brief and it needs to be very focused on seeking godly counsel on what to do, not a place to just sort of talk about other people because oftentimes that satisfies the, the ickiness we feel and the, the justice, you know, break in us that we feel enough where we're, we can be tempted to just, nah, I'm not actually going to go to them now. Like I got it out of my system. I got to say the things I want to say about the situation or the person, and I'm not actually going to go talk to them. And then now you're in sin because you've just gossiped and slandered about them. And you're actually disobeying God's word, which is telling us to go when we see it, to be bold and to go speak the truth in love. And so I think, yeah, doing it is important. How we do it is really important, obviously, and the the timing of those things. And um, I think doing that in private is really important. Mm -hmm. I think that's, there's this idea where people read, you know, Matthew 18 and think somehow like publicly calling people out is what that means. (laughs) It's like, no, (laughs) like one person go to them. Like inherently in all of that is this idea that you're going to somebody to try to, to reconcile, to try to lovingly confront and you're doing it privately, giving them an opportunity to repent, giving an opportunity for conversation, not putting someone on blast or exposing somebody like that's how the world does it. The world wants to cancel people. They want to force them to change by just plastering their sin out for everybody to see, to try to, 
to either to try to disqualify them to you know tear down their character and it's like that is not how christians approach things we should approach it quietly um, personally directly uh, in such a way that we have inte- we have integrity with how we've spoken of them how we've dealt with it um and, and we're trying to we're trying to seek the Lord with them. Uh, we're not. We're not trying to uh, make something happen for ourselves. And so, um, yeah, it just gentility and a, and a heart to restore, um, not to beat someone down, is just what what we want. And also, you know, I think I'll just throw this in there: being willing to, you know, actually be joyous if somebody just does repent. Yeah, I think sometimes, you know, sometimes this doesn't go well because people are, you know, unrepentant and defensive. But sometimes people just go, "Okay, you're right." And you know what? It doesn't feel great when someone just repents immediately and wants to change. And it's like, well, I'm still mad. Or I, oh, I feel like something else needs to happen. Or you need to like make up for what you did or whatever. And it's like, Hey, if someone repents, like celebrate that, like mm-hmm. let, let God handle, ha- handle this. Don't, you know, don't look for some, something in you to be satisfied with mm-hmm. justice like that. Mm-hmm. I've, I've experienced that as well. Yeah. I think also, um, all of us can be a little better about being confronted. Mm-hmm. Um, all of us love the idea in theory, but we're also terrified to do it Mm -hmm. of confronting others, but also even open yourself up to being confronted. If you're in a good community of faith and you're involved regularly with them, I think it's, it's courageous sometimes to just say, Hey, I I don't know. Something's off right now in my life, or maybe Mm -hmm. I feel far from the Lord or there's tension in my marriage or something's going on. Like, do you guys see something in me? Mm -hmm. Cause I can't see it myself. Yeah. And be open to being confronted because it creates that number one, that, that demystifies what confrontation is. It's not this big, like blowout judicial system. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a private cup of coffee, Yeah, you know, but opening yourself up, it demystifies it. It deescalates the situation where someone says, Hey man, I'm glad you asked. I just, over the last few months, it's kind of been bothering me. I've seen some of these, these behaviors or attitudes in you. Um, is everything okay? Mm-hmm. You know, that's most often where the, con- the, yeah. the Concern. content, yeah, the content's going to lead is, is in a concerned area. It's not, I want to find you out and know your sins. So I can yeah. know your deep, dirty, dirty secrets. It's like, I want you to look like Jesus mm-hmm. and all of us do not look enough like Jesus. So opening ourselves up to being confronted, I think would, would demystify the whole situation. And then one thing we talk about frequently is keep short accounts. Yeah. Um, if it is actual sin and you're not overlooking it, um, keep short accounts. Don't sit on it and let that root of bitterness go deeper and wider. Don't let it grow deeper and wider in your soul because you're going to turn a level two problem into a level 10 problem. And then the meeting you're going to go into, it's not going to be a simple, let's talk about it for 15 minutes and then talk about life and marriage and kids and stuff. Yeah. It's going to turn into this two hour mediated nonsense because you let it fester yeah. and grow instead of keeping short enough accounts to just say, let's do this now. Let's, I saw it now. Let's do it now. Yeah, I love that. I think it's like you said. It's there's a there's a boldness that we need to have to confront and a willingness to do that. There's a right attitude um, around it. There's a you know a timetable there in a way that we honor the person and that we're and we're not letting bitterness grow. But I think kind of playing off a little bit of what you said, like I think to be somebody who goes and confronts is like we need to also be a person who's who's known. To, as, as a person who has been confronted well, who receives criticism and, and, and confrontation well, but also somebody who asks for it, mm-hmm. like who seeks out, you know, hey, I feel, you know, I'm having a hard time, like not just, oh, woe is me, you know, when you're with your brothers and sisters in Christ, but confessing sin, <laughs> being somebody who can, who directly owns and confesses your wrongs. Um, but even, yeah, there's times when in a relationship, you can feel like something feels off. Um, I've done, I've, I've done this many, many times in the last couple of years and I've tried to grow in that where it's just like, I want to just go seek that and go, Hey, things feel off. Like, have I done something to offend you? Mm-hmm. And just like, pers- like opening yourself up, like not just, okay, we all got to be ready to go do it for someone else and hope that, you know, if we're blind, feel blindsided, we respond well, but like we should practice being the kind of people who, who proactively seek our own growth and our own sanctification. And we're asking other people, um, help me see my blind spots, call me out when I need to be called out, hold me accountable, speak truth to me mm-hmm. so that we can grow and actually wanting that. And so I know when that happens, like admitting our faults and apologizing, accepting consequences, not making excuses, like owning it, you know, and then thanking people and, and trying to pursue the Lord in that. And so I think, yeah, if we're, if we're opening ourselves up to others, we're practicing that um, not so we can confront, but it should be both. It's mm-hmm. not that uh, just a bunch of confronters and then, Oh, I hope I handle it right when it comes to me, yeah. you know, like that's not going to go right. well. Um, so yeah, I, I think growing in humility is not just about how we approach people when we confront. It's like being a person who's receptive. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it just has empathy and compassion as well. Like just, I think that's an area we all continually need to grow in so that we can 
confront people well um, so that we can seek understanding and, and come from a place of love and yeah. not from a place of, of you know, stale black yeah. and white justice alone. Yeah. I think also when we're considering this idea of confrontation and, and reconciliation, something I've thought about a lot for the last few years is um, there's a difference between reconciliation and restoration. Yeah. Um, reconciliation means you're on friendly terms. Um, so you're, maybe your relationship, you're, you're, there's no vitriol. There's no like, ah, I gotta go hide in the bathroom when I see her walking in or yeah. what, you're not afraid to run into each other at Home Depot. Like you're, you're reconciled. There's no ill will. There's no sin that's, you know, been unconfessed or forgiven in the midst of the relationship. But restoration is taking it a step further. And it's like, we're going to go back to where we were. Right. Um, and, and God tells us to reconcile. He doesn't necessarily say every relationship is going to be restored. Yeah. Sometimes the sin is so egregious and ongoing and the relationship is so broken. Mm-hmm. There can be forgiveness, reconciliation, so to speak, but it'll never go back to what it was, um, at least until glory. And I think we need to be a little bit open handed with that as well and not confuse the two terms because yeah. maybe you and a person aired the aired the situation out and you walked away, you both confessed, you both forgave, you prayed for each other. And then what you say at the end of that is just, I love you. The Lord loves you. Nothing's going to change that, but we're just never going to have what we had. And that's okay. Yeah, totally. Like you said, and I think both, um, was it Romans 12? Um, as far as it depends on you to be at peace with everyone, you're not even going to be reconciled to everybody. Right. Like there's going to be people who just don't want it, won't yep. do it. And it's just, it is awkward and it is weird, but it's, like we have to own and it's a, it's a good gut check. I'm just, as I'm thinking now, like how, how, you know, we have to take some responsibility in that. We don't wait for other people to do it and we don't put the full weight and pressure of restoration on, on conflicts. So even just that question again, um, who, who knows, you know, what, what the person who sent this question in um, specifically is thinking about, but it's a good question. I'm sure it's a question we all have is like, if you go into confrontation expecting restoration, you want the full scope of that. Like that doesn't always happen. That's mm-hmm. not promised. And so you might have the wrong expectations of something. Um, if it's not going as far as you want, or you just, you want everything to be back the way it was. Like you yeah. said, I think that's a great way to phrase it. And that may not be, be true. All we have to do is try to pursue reconciliation, to admit our faults, to try to open ourselves up to try to do that work. But no, some people will reject it when we do it. Some people won't even entertain the conversation, but we have to be willing um, to pursue it. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Fun topic. Yeah, super fun. You got a, you got a little fun question for us to, to transition from the, the weight of that before we close out here? I do. And, and, and church, thank you. Thank you for continuing to write these questions. And these are super helpful and, and, I'm, and I'm loving considering these things. Okay. Uh, Mount Rushmore of music. Who are Ooh. your four? And they could be any category. And I mean, just because we're on a church podcast, it doesn't have to be Christian. It it can't be Christian bands. It has to be outside of that category. Because it's like, Mm. it's like, you know, I love Shane and Shane and Chris Tomlin (laughs) and Michael W. Smith and um, maybe Gunger, even though they deconstructed. (laughs) So who is it? Who's your four? Man, that's a hard question. That's like, oh, what are your favorite movies of all time? It's like, there's a lot. And as, as you know, uh, I've told you many times, many people don't know. I'm, I'm big in music. It's not just worship stuff at church. I love music. I listen to tons of different kinds. So man, probably thinking of like historical influence and things I've listened to the, the most probably Radiohead comes to, comes to the forefront. So I've been a big like rock and independent alternative music guy. Um, listen to them a ton. Um, I've listened to a lot of John Mayer. I like that. Mm-hmm. I like his good, the guitar style and stuff. Um, man, I'll get, I'll go start with those two and then you'll, you, you do your two and I'm going to think of, yeah. You, yeah. Maybe you have all your four. I don't know. I do have my four cause I wrote the question this time beforehand. Yeah. Um, not, and my, not fair. My musical tastes are very eclectic. And it's always changing. Like you walked into my office earlier and I was like blasting Hans Zimmer. <laughs> yeah, you were. And, and it's just, I love it. It added so, a lot of intensity to that conversation. Yeah. It wasn't intense. <laughs> um, okay. So Jack Johnson, love Jack Johnson. Always have. Um, someone in the country category. I, I, I'll put Chris Stapleton there right now, but I've been real big on this guy named Zach Top lately. Mm. Not Zach Bryan. I like Zach Bryan, but Zach Top. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've moved my country tastes lately into a lot more of the Western category, not mm. the, not the pop category. Interesting. So I don't know if I'm just like between Jack Johnson and slow country music. I'm just kind of like, you know, like an old dog just getting slow in my older age as I'm just really getting up there in years. Um, 
formative throughout junior high and high school, Blink-182, they're on my oh, Mount yeah. Rushmore. Um, and then uh, Iration, they're a, a, kind of a reggae rock band from Santa Barbara. All the guys are originally from Hawaii, but they live in Santa Barbara now, and I love that type of music. So mm. those are my four. That's good. Yeah. I guess if I have to pick a couple more, I think I only have two that I would put in the rush more. I have to think more about like, man, I don't know if I'd put anyone else that's in that, in that slot. So <laughs> I'm going to cheat and just, <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm going to give you some, some, some artists I've been listening to lately Ooh. that I really like. Um, let's see here. Hmm. I think I'll go probably Tom Mish. He's a, <laughs> he's like a kind of a good, guitar virtuoso guy who does r&b style music like guitar um and some jazz stuff like that i really like his music i've been listening to that a ton over the last couple of years um and then how else am i gonna cheat i'm just gonna go through my spotify and just pick another artist i've been thinking big thief yoko ono listen to big thief a lot these last couple years like folk kind of indie band not yoko ono (laughs) yoko ono ruins (laughs) there's a great there's a great there's a great video (laughs) Of Chuck Berry playing yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> with the Beatles, video. and she's <laughs> Yoko Ono just starts like screaming into a mic, and there's like I somebody see. zoomed in on his eyes, and it's like, oh, this is cool, like Chuck Berry and the Beatles, like two legend legendary musical groups, like playing together, and then all of a sudden she just starts screeching yep. and screaming, and the camera zooms in on his eyes, and his eyes just go so wide yep. with bewilderment of like, what is happening? And like looks at her, looks around, like does anyone else notice this? And yep. it's like the Beatles are just like. Oh yeah, we're used to this. They, yeah. they don't even react at all. I love it. Okay, um, because I like I just sometimes like you know stirring stirring things Uh-oh. up a little bit, and we haven't quite gone an hour, so we got a little bit of wiggle room here. Um, <laughs> thanks for listening. My Mount Rushmore for bands that everyone likes that I don't like. Overrated this is a, Mount this Rushmore. Is a very Travis question. I don't. The Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Um, not a fan of the Beatles. Good night. Um, okay, so so the Beatles, Post Malone. You Sur- don't like Post. Malone. Surprise, he's still alive. To be honest, wow. with, with the way that guy lives, um, not a, not a big Post Malone fan. Um, Drake. I know. I I've tried. I really I really have tried, and just not a fan. Not a fan at all. And then, uh, hmm. I mean, everyone's united in disliking Nickelback, so that's not really that much of a hot take. <laughs> what? <laughs> not a Nickelback fan. So, what do you have a Mount Rushmore of bands that everyone I, likes that you I don't, don't like? I don't think about things that I don't like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As much, I'll say that I don't have like a oh man, I love to hate on this. Yeah, yeah. You know, I haven't maybe listed things in sermons over the years that are just like <laughs> things you shouldn't need like, Jello, <laughs> like Jello or Why whatever Jell-O? else. Anyone who's been in Story Church a while know there was a there's a good season where we got we got some hot takes and things that were dumb that just got dropped in sermons occasionally. It was really Androids, fun. Jello. Yeah, I mean, we can just keep going. So, anyways. I mean, I don't. I'm not a big fan of like post '90s hip hop. I like nineties yeah. hip hop a lot, so I don't know. That's not that's not my thing. <clears throat> I can get down with a little bit of of like nineties, early two thousands country, mm-hmm. but like mainstream country today for the most part. Like there's some I, there's some bands that I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, and some artists I wouldn't include in that. But like mm-hmm. the very like almost weird like hip hop mixed hip hop pop country combo stuff. Um, not a big fan. Sam Hunt. That's it. That's the name oh. you're searching for. It's like sometimes he just talks into the mic it's not he's not quite rapping and he's also not singing it's like what what's going on here yeah like I'm a, i didn't go to a poet jam here i'll i'll left i'll just drop this bomb and then we can get out of here and we'll see what happens hopefully no one gets too mad but it's not just about the super bowl but i am not a fan of modern day taylor swift yeah i'll tell you what that folklore album she did with bony bear bony bear is excellent that album is so good but I am just not, I'm not a fan of, of what happened to Taylor in recent years. So I'm not, I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of the chiefs and, uh, I'm hoping the Niners win and I'm preaching. So we'll see, we'll see what, what I look like or what I say from the stage on Sunday. But, um, yeah, go Niners. Very good. I I like that hot takes on Taylor Swift. There we go. There we go. Yeah. We know it usually goes well for people who do that. So I'm, I'm really optimistic (laughs) about what's going to (laughs) happen. Hope to see you next week. Oh man. All right. Well, this has been episode um, five of story conversations. Uh, Keep sending us your questions and uh, we'll see you this Sunday and uh, continue this conversation next week. Bye.